talking about science fiction very explicitly here. Now, I love science fiction. Uh, it's something I've loved my whole life since the first science fiction book I picked up when I was a kid. And I'm sure many of you also love science fiction. That's why you're here. But if you're a Christian of any stripe, or even if you're just sort of any kind of religion that you take seriously, you're going to have this kind of awkward relationship to science fiction because you'll enjoy science fiction, and then all of a sudden, inevitably, some some crazy nonsensical thing will get said about religion or about Christianity, something that's ahistorical, something that maybe has a lot of animus in it. Uh, all kinds of secular biases are all over science fiction, especially the 20th century sort of classics. Science fiction has older precursors, you know, H.G. Wells and this stuff. But by the time we get into the golden and silver age, like 60s and 70s science fiction, the whole genre is replete with secular themes and secular ideas. This raises the question, you know, the sort of normal question, how does a Christian read science fiction? How does a Christian engage with science fiction? And it also brings us to this other question, which is, well, why, why does science fiction have all these weird secular themes in it? Originally, the genre is just more broad than this kind of narrow set of, you know, robots and AI and space travel and Starfleet and all this stuff. The precursor for the genre is really this idea of, of the novel of ideas. You know, speculative fiction was a, a very early and original name for the science fiction genre. What if questions, hypotheticals. This is very general. You could write anything about this. But why is it that science fiction as a genre has sort of gone on this weird secular path and engaged in all these sort of systemic secular tropes? There's no inherent reason it has to be this way. And this will help us approach this first question, how as Christians do we engage with science fiction? My main thesis is that in science fiction, how it's played out historically, the reason it unfolds this way and manifests these secular themes is that it has, at the, at the very core basis, a lot of these writers are starting their worldview with deeply modern and secular assumptions about reality, about truth claims, about history, about being. And if we can go in and identify those assumptions, we can see where, where all this kind of secular stuff comes from, why it is that, you know, uh, Patrick Stewart's character, Jean-Luc Picard, in the Federation, Next Generation, there, it's replete with enlightenment sort of statements about progress and scientific knowledge and all this kind of stuff. I love Star Trek, I love Jean-Luc Picard, but it's there, right? We need to engage with that. So what I want to do is look at, see if we can make a very cursory look into what are these secular assumptions like embedded deep in the genre. And to do that, I want to do it by contrast. We're going to contrast it with C.S. Lewis. Now, C.S. Lewis writes science fiction. Side note, not many people know, this is part of a bet that he and Tolkien had. Tolkien was to write a time travel story, and Lewis was to write a space story, and typically, Tolkien never finished, and Lewis wrote a trilogy. So, good for us. If you want to read The Lost Road, uh, the half of it that we have, it's in The Lost Tales of Middle Earth, or Other Tales of Middle Earth, volume something, you can look it up. Okay, our focus is the space trilogy. Now, Lewis goes to write science fiction in the golden era of science fiction. And he is an academic, he's, a, he's aware, he's a Cambridge man, he's aware of what's going on with these secular assumptions in sci-fi. And he enters into the genre self-conscious of all of these problems and biases, and he makes a deliberate effort to identify and to undermine these secular themes. Well, what does he do instead? He substitutes them with a different set of assumptions and values. What is that set? He's a Cambridge man. Medieval theology. Medieval assumptions. And specifically, we can contrast modern versus medieval. Secular versus religious. And this is the set that he brings to bear on science fiction. So what I want to do briefly is highlight just three assumptions that we see at the heart of this kind of genre, the mainstream sort of secular science fiction, and then we'll contrast each one to C.S. Lewis's take, how his assumption is different, and what sort of different story that it ultimately yields. 
And I'm going to argue that it makes for better science fiction in the end. You'll see. So, for those of you who don't know, who's read Space Trilogy, first of all? This is really important. Oh, wow. Okay, great. Everywhere I go, people are like, I'm like, I love C.S. Lewis. I love C.S. Lewis, too. Which is Space Trilogy is your favorite? Space what? <laughs> it's very obscure and it's a very underrated set of works. But I've, I've talked to some Lewis and Tolkien scholars and they, the sort of consensus at that level is that the Space Trilogy is among his most sophisticated works, just under Till We Have Faces. That's another discussion. Okay, so I will summarize briefly for those of you who don't know. It, it follows a sort of normal H.G. Wells science fiction uh, beginning at first. The first people to ever invent a spaceship and leave Earth, go to Mars and other planets and encounter alien life. And it follows the protagonist, Elwin Ransom, and all of his observations. And there are a couple of not so nice men that go with him that end up being a good foil for him and for the worldviews that Lewis is trying to oppose. So no spoilers, but you will. this is like a preview if you haven't read it. I encourage you to do so. OK, so. Theme number one, how is the cosmos portrayed in science fiction? Now, it's hard to generalize genres, but a very common thing we see in science fiction is the cosmos being portrayed as sort of inherently meaningless. And we see this in the way that, well, on a lot of levels. One is we talk about the, the vastness of space. You know, there's a lot of emphasis in a lot of science fiction, especially movies, where you get these uh, evocative visuals of the, the darkness, the emptiness of space, the incredible loneliness that you experience being out there. And the alien, right? The idea of the other, the foreign thing, the thing that is separated from us by almost always an unbridgeable gap. And that gap is usually bridged by hostility and power struggles. Great example of this is the movie, I love this movie, uh, Ridley Scott's Alien movie. Wonderful movie, beautifully done, but it hits all these themes because he's, so, he's such a good director. Not only is the, the alien encounter, it's not mediated by speech, but by power and survival of the fittest and, and, and sort of nature's blind struggle to survive. And the directing captures the vast stretches of emptiness, the huge ship moving soundlessly through the blackness, Ripley's eventual isolation. Uh, she's sort of isolated at the beginning because no one listens to her. They all die, and then she's isolated at the end with her cat. And she's just drifting off into oblivion, hoping that she makes an encounter with something that isn't this like horror-filled encounter, but because that's sort of the, the assumed norm. And the, the sort of secular theme here, this, this assertion of meaningless, it has meaninglessness. It has a lot of origins. You know, a big theme, obviously, is the way that Darwinism affected the 18 and 1900s with this idea that nature is this blind, uncaring entity, that survival of the fittest is ultimately random. Nature doesn't care about you. And so when man in science fiction goes out to the cosmos, what he encounters is just these brute forces, other beings, sort of jostled together in the cosmos, trying to survive, trying to sort of scrape a living by. You know, the alien, is it wicked? Or is it just following its natural biological process to feed and reproduce? But no, it's a horror movie. But that contrast is kind of the real horror of the film, is that ultimately, the alien is just trying to survive. Ripley is just trying to survive. You see this in the second movie, where it's the second movie about motherhood, mm -hmm. if you remember the yeah. ending. It's about the alien mother protecting her children and Ripley protecting the girl that she sort of adopts as her daughter figure. And so that motherhood struggle, it humanizes the alien a little bit. But to me, the deeper horror is that that's all it is. Spile the fittest, reproduction, nature is blind, the universe is meaningless. And this is maybe the best example, but there are lots of examples you can think of about science fiction that draws on these sort of fundamental assumptions about meaning in the universe. What does Lewis do instead? So when they travel to Mars first, those of you who read the book, I'm going to skip all the old solar and Malachandrian language dialects and just translate them into English for the people who haven't read it. It's a lot of jargon. Ransom is a philologist. 
Lewis knows like 20 languages to skip. Okay, so when they go to Mars, they encounter alien life forms of all kinds of biological and non-biological and so on. And what the men of Earth quickly realize, and what Ransom quickly realizes, is that the whole cosmos, there's life on all these other worlds in our solar system, and the whole cosmos is peopled by beings that all have a remarkably similar shared worldview. They all are united in this belief that the universe is full of meaning. An example of this is in the speech. We talk about space. The final frontier. Well, what does space mean? Space is a word that means empty, right? In the, in the space trilogy, when they encounter these alien races, they don't have this vocabulary. What they call space, they call space the deep heavens. They call it the field of the sun. That's how you would translate that. And like, this mythic imagery is imagery that is imbued with meaning in deep contrast to what we talked about with Alien and with Ripley. And so, they talk to these aliens and they all talk about hierarchy of being and order in the cosmos and they're all friendly to each other because they all share the same worldview and the language they use to depict space and space travel and other alien cultures is mythic and resonant and full of meaning. It turns out that only the Earthmen are the ones who are cut off. That explains man's constant fear and anxiety about other races and alienation, and it's the Earthmen that end up acting like the murderers and the savages and the beasts. And it's, it's we'll get to this in the second point, it's the primitive cultures that are the more sort of enlightened ones. And so it takes a long time for, for them, for Ransom, to sort of adjust to this new worldview, and because he's from this Earth that has these themes of separation and anxiety that we talked about in Alien. So, that contrast of meaning, meaningless universe, that's modern, that's secular, the meaning-laden universe, that's medieval, and ancient, and religious. Part two. One of the, my biggest pet peeves when we engage with science fiction is um, the myth of progress. This is what historians call it, because it, it's, you know, it's, it's been debunked. History cycles, comes and goes. Civilizations rise, civilizations fall. But in early modernity, with the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, the idea was that there's sort of, this builds on evolution and tries to make it positive. There's sort of a theme of inevitable progress along a sort of spectrum of improvement where you start somewhere and then as just time goes on, your civilization becomes more advanced technologically, morally, and you become Superior. Star Trek is a great example of this. We encounter other races, and all the races are along one single linear spectrum. More advanced than Starfleet, less advanced than Starfleet. And the more advanced ones will say stuff like, oh, we evolved beyond resentment millennia ago. And, and so there's this, there's this weird sense that moral progress is just made by time. Somehow evolution now switched into this more sort of creative form, guides things along toward their eventual perfection, and there's a, there's a combination of moral and technological advancement that are hand in hand in science fiction. Uh, we, we are not like those medievals who with their you know, dark ages and, and uh, here's some lovely filth over there, you know, Monty Python is, is really cashing in on this dark ages stereotype, which we now know is completely untrue, and it contrasts with, uh, well, there's a lot to say about that. But basically, the Renaissance humanists are deeply suspicious of the Enlightenment, or of the medieval era. They think that everyone there was just blind fideists. They just, they just were mindlessly slaves of religion. And that's why they had no technology, no medicine, whatever. But when we cast off the church, ah, the Renaissance, the rebirth, and then the Enlightenment, so grandiose. Now we have medicine, unlike those foolish priests and people back then. And that narrative is so systemic, it's in popular culture everywhere, it's in the water. We all talk this way because we are all children of this weird secular age that has this historical bias. Now, Lewis knocks this on its head in a beautiful encounter between the sort of fallen Earthmen and the simple, humble people of Mars. Uh, 
one of the characters turns out to be not such a nice guy, Weston. He embodies the voice of this myth of progress and secular humanism for Lewis's age. And it'll sound very sort of uh, stereotypical and awful when we read it. I'm going to read you a passage. But, but that's kind of, a, he's not strawmanning really that much because that's how this view was held at this point in, in the, sort of the 60s and 70s and 50s. So Lewis, being a brilliant writer, he makes the contrast. Weston has come to Mars. He's learned sort of a primitive grasp on the language because his disdain for the natives doesn't allow him to sort of acknowledge their sophistication. And all he can say is sort of what we think of the primitive talk, you know, me, me get you, me take your thing, you, you die. Like he, he talks like a savage. The roles are inversed, whereas the savage people, you know, the primitives, they don't have sophisticated weaponry. It's basically Stone Age with a little bit of Bronze Age is what they encounter on Mars. Not terribly sophisticated, but we find a separation that Lewis makes between technological sophistication and moral sophistication. And in science fiction, they're combined all the time, but in, in the space trilogy, Lewis says, well, why? There's no reason. And of course, World War II has shown us that technological superiority does not equal moral superiority. We know this now from the 20th century. So this scene, Weston struggles. Lewis is poking fun at him for being the real native who can't understand. Finally, Ransom, who has learned the language, uh, goes to interpret, because Ransom doesn't hate the natives. He grows to love them. Ransom uh, interprets for Weston. And then Weston starts making his speech about myth of progress. And Lewis is forced to translate it into unadorned Martian language. And in doing so, reveals exactly kind of the silliness uh, and simplicity of the myth of progress. And I'll just read you a short, a short little excerpt here. The whole dialogue is, is intensely funny and revealing and sad at the same time. But we only have time for little bits and pieces. So this is. Weston addressing the, the leader of Mars. And well, we'll get to that. He says, to you I may seem a vulgar robber, but I bear on my shoulders the destiny of the human race. Your tribal life with its Stone Age weapons and beehive huts, its primitive coracles and elementary social structure has nothing to compare with our civilization, with our science, medicine, and law, our armies, our architecture, our commerce and our transport system, which is rapidly annihilating space and time. Our right to supersede you is the right of the higher over the lower. So you get some echoes of 19th century colonialism here. All right, so this is how Ransom translates this into Martian. Um, all right, I'll just translate all the Malacandra. Sorry to the fans. Um, among us, Ransom says, in translation, there is a kind of person who will take other people's food and things when they are not looking. He says he is not an ordinary one of this kind. <laughs> he says what P does now will make very different things happen to those of our people who are not yet born. He says that among you, people of one kindred all live together, and they have spears like those we used to have a very long time ago, and huts are small and round, and your boats are small and light, like our old ones. And you only have one ruler. He says, it is different with us. He says, we know much. There is a thing, uh, there is a thing that happens in our world when the body of a living creature feels pain and becomes weak, and he says, we sometimes know how to stop it. <laughs> he says, we have many bent, this is, there's no word for evil in Martian, they call them bent. He says, we have many bent people, and we kill them or shut them in huts, and that we have people for settling quarrels between other people and about their huts and mates and things. He says, we have many ways for the, for the person of one land to kill those of another, and some are trained to do it. He says, we build very big and strong huts of stone and other things. And he says, we exchange many things among ourselves and can carry heavy weights very quickly a long way. Because of this, he says it would not be the act of a bent person if our people killed all your people. So there's the myth of progress for you, right? Ugh. And survival of fittest, too. And laid out in these terms, Lewis's deep 
I mean, he's having way too much fun with this, obviously. Uh, <laughs> but, but this is the contrast, you know. Is there a myth of progress in which case there are certain rights and, and forces of nature and evolution and whatever? Or, for the Martians, they all accept death. And they all have a, a much higher sense of moral superiority. You know, the leader of, of Mars ends up chastising Weston after all of his speeches and says, you know, you don't really know anything at all. The, the youngest of my people, the little children, um, basically he didn't, not in these words, but he says, they have more moral character and moral maturity than you do. Your people are very unsophisticated, actually. So there's this contrast between the Bronze Age people who turn out to be more sophisticated, where it really counts, than the sort of highly sophisticated, you know, puffed up men of Earth. And this involves an assumption about, a medieval assumption about humility and right relation to the cosmos versus the pride and the attempt to dominate the cosmos which is inherent in the myth of progress and in modernity and the enlightenment. Okay, third thing that's interesting. So this was a little abstract, but I think it's actually the most, therefore like the most subtle and most pernicious uh, assumption that we see inherent in all this sort of science fiction and in our daily life when we just speak this way. This is the assumption of scientism, which is the belief that science, we talk a lot about this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the quick and dirty parts of epistemology. This is the belief that science is the only or highest lens for truth. It's, it's really the only valid dare for truth. If we can prove it with science, yes. If we can't, no, forget it. It's unscientific nonsense. That's a phrase Weston uses a lot in the books. So, this explains to me very easily not just science fiction's hostility to religion, but its complete lack of understanding of what religion is. I mean, the, 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 the kind of straw men that you see in science fiction of religious characters, it's almost too generous to call them straw men. You know, I watch it and I'm like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, but that's not Christianity of like, any kind. So I don't know where they get this from. But I think it's part of this, this confusion about knowledge is really at the root of all of this stuff. So just real quick academic sort of bring us together here. The issue with knowledge is that science is great. Science works with facts. Facts are great. But the idea is that truth is not exhausted by facts. So the modern person equates the two. Truth, fact, synonyms. Done. The medieval man makes a distinction between truth and fact and between both and myth. And we use myth as an antonym for truth and fact in modernity, but in, in the medieval mind and in the ancient mind, these three work together in sort of an economy of truth. So truth is kind of the surface level of, of or facts are kind of the surface level of truth. You know, that's, that's what you can know and that's what you can verify. That's the heart of what a fact is. We disagree about the boiling point of water. We can do an experiment, you can prove it to me. Done, okay. That's useful. Problem is, you all know, if you take five seconds to think about it, that this doesn't exhaust all the things in your life that you know to be true, <laughs> right? Like, you, you can't verify to me any of the things that probably are most important to you. Things about your relationships, your spouses, your children, your families to say nothing of religious experience, but aesthetic experience too. That's not meaningless either. And so the, the whole vast myriad of different kinds of truth and ways of approaching it, I'm not talking about subjectivism. I'm talking about different modes that are all true, but not verifiable. So that kind of nuanced thinking about truth is absent in modern science fiction. They encounter something like, can't prove it, don't know. Like the best you get is agnosticism. We're like, well, we don't have all the facts. It's like, you'll never have all the facts, you know? There's this kind of weird thing where people, it's weird, people are searching for God. So there's this theme in science fiction you see where it's like, all right, we went to the final frontier, we looked everywhere, didn't find God. It's like, <laughs> but you see how that's actually a category error. It's not the same, it's not the same, mode of inquiry.
to go search around for black holes as it is, well, maybe black holes is a bad example, but search around for other stars and, and to search for God or to search for, for the deeper truth part of, of, of being. And so when we make the distinction, suddenly myth opens up to us as this whole rich genre full of meaning and truth and things to teach us. So you can imagine how this comes out in science fiction. What happens with Lewis? Trying very not hard not to spoil this, at some point in the trilogy, Ransom realizes he has to have a physical fight with somebody on another world. And you know, it's for a very good cause. It's it's to save all these things. It's very important. Trust me. <laughs> and he kind of knows he needs to do it, but he sort of is struggling under modern ideas of truth values. And he he resists the idea initially because he thinks he thinks a crude materialistic struggle is so I don't know unspiritual. It's not cool. Uh, it's and the analogy he jumps is, well, that sounds like mere mythology to me, you know, where there's a fright and two gods battle and one wins, you know. And he, he thinks that this is this is weird, but then he gets his check because he's been in the cosmos and he's seen all these other perspectives and he realizes that, that he's invoking this bias I'm talking about, scientism and opposing myth to truth and all this stuff. So I'll just read you this very short bit here. No such crude materialistic struggle could possibly be what God really intended, I'm translating them. Any suggestion to the contrary must be only his own morbid fantasy. It would degrade the spiritual warfare to the condition of mere mythology. But there he got another check. Long since on Mars, and more strongly since he came to Venus, Ransom had been perceiving that the triple distinction of truth from myth and of both from fact was purely terrestrial, meaning earthly. Part of that, part and parcel of that unhappy division between soul and body which resulted from the fall. Even on earth, the sacraments exist as a permanent reminder that the division is neither wholesome nor final, that is bodily component. The incarnation had, had been the beginning of its disappearance. In Paralandra, it would have no meaning at all. Whatever happened here would be of such a nature that Earthmen would call it mythological. But he's passed beyond this sort of scientism assumptions that are built into, into all this stuff. And so later when things happen on, on Mars and Venus, you know, the, the people there make songs and poetry about it. And it sort of becomes like our myth, but it's true, right? All right, so in closing, I want to, and we're, we're not able to even begin to exhaust all of, all of these themes in, in Lewis, but in closing, I want to look at the ultimate state of science fiction, sort of as a genre, as an enterprise, wh what are we sort of doing with it, where could we go, where should we go? So we've seen how these secular assumptions play out in science fiction. And I want to offer that they actually have a very narrowing effect on the genre. They kind of lead to a very closed-minded, very singular worldview about what is and what is not allowed to be explored. This is not true for all science fiction. A lot of science fiction, even despite its secular themes, is very provocative. But, but fundamentally, it's very difficult for science fiction to get beyond this paradigm of all of its secular and modern assumptions. And so a work like Lewis, it's unprecedented, and there's still nothing like it, because he inverts this worldview that's at the bottom of it. So I want to offer that we can do better. We can sort of go beyond secular science fiction to engage not just the fact part and then speculating about all these facts, but we can get more at truth and myth and their integration with fact in going beyond sort of where science fiction has been able to achieve so far into even more thorough, more deep uh, ventures of the mind, which is what I think the space trilogy gives us. And I want to close with Lewis's depiction of the planetary angels, because I think that's, that's like a, the paradigmatic uh, synthesis that he creates to show us 
an example of how we can move forward in our investigation of science fiction. So for those of you who don't know, in this cosmology that he creates, every there's, there's like spiritual immaterial beings whose natural habitat is the deep heaven, and they move in space, basically. And there are like sort of grand ones, like arch ones, who rule over each of the planets in our solar system. And they steward those, those worlds. Uh, he calls them planetary angels. They're basically archangels, or you can call them the gods. Now, his depiction of them is very interesting because it synthesizes three things. And I think those three things are the whole corpus of Western thinking about this sort of thing. I'll show you briefly. They are the gods of paganism. They run the world, they steward the world. They, they watch over things, they you know, control weather, they do all this stuff. They're the elemental powers. Side note, uh, the, the concept of the daimones, the sort of the spirit in, in Greek thinking, became so associated with element that the word daimon actually came to be a synonym for the word element, the way we would use it now in antiquity among these writers. That gives you a sense of the elements, the stewards of the elements, the gods. OK, that's one. Two, he also he preserves all that, and then he fits it into a Christian medieval cosmological hierarchy. There's the archangels, and they all serve the one God, who's mentioned all over. That's the whole core of their theology in the Space Trilogy. So they are the gods, but they serve like little g, pagan sense, but they serve the one God, and the whole cosmos ends up being in this perfect harmony of hierarchy. That's very medieval, right? Organize everything into hierarchy. Uh, and then the third element that he brings in is the modern. So he doesn't hand wave them at all uh, as like weird phenomenon or mysteries. It actually takes you a long time when you're reading the first book to realize that, oh, I see what you did. They are archangels. Because they're talked about purely in terms of their physical phenomena. When the when the elder describe themselves to Ransom, they talk about themselves basically in sort of a weird dimensional relativity language. They talk about how we have bodies, but we move on a different plane than yours. So you know the earth, the worlds seem to us to be immaterial. That's why we just pass through them. And the heavens are the the deep things. Like gravity makes this this. Um, to them, like a physical presence in the field of heaven, and that's the world that they walk on and live in. But this contrast between these two ways of being, Lewis just explains it all with dimensions and with sort of, it's quasi-concept, quasi-relativity. I mean, this is all, this is like the 50s, so kind of some slack. But, but the, the fundamental idea is that this can be explained very simply and very easily using concepts from modern physics. And that's how he lays them out. And then, like I said, later Ransom's like, oh, I see. So his first encounter with them is as phenomena, like any other phenomena that we can encounter. So he brings in this picture of the planetary god, the, the ancient, uh, the medieval Christian, the ancient pagan, the medieval Christian, and the modern understanding of scientific knowledge. So it's not, his, the, his mythology is not a retreat or a rejection of science or modernity, the best fruits of modernity. It's a synthesis of all of these elements of Western culture. And to me, I read that and I go, yes, right. That's what science fiction needs to be doing. But you see the whole, the whole train of this thought, which is you can't begin to make those kinds of investigations into the beyond, into things that, into the real final frontier of like writing and doing science fiction until you identify and discard sort of these poisonous, narrowing assumptions that's in science fiction. And so what I'm suggesting is that it's precisely Lewis's, I don't know what you say, his education, his interest in the medieval, his interest in, in the multidimensionality of truth, not just fact, that allows him to do what I think is some of the greatest science fiction ever written in terms of its boldness, its newness, it's, it's fresh today, 50, 60 years later, it's fresh. And no one is doing this because we're still slaves to these genre assumptions that come from the Enlightenment and that come from secularism. And so I think this is some of the best science fiction ever written. And uh, it's why it's such a shame that it's such an underread work of his. So if you haven't read, I encourage you to do so really nothing else like it. Promise isn't a plug for the book. They don't get any money. 
But uh, this is where I would go if I were you, thinking about science fiction. When you watch science fiction, look for these tropes and then ask yourself, all right, what if we tweak this with the medieval assumption, or a Christian assumption? Thank you. I kept thinking of science fiction that I think breaks some of these secular molds that you were proposing. Um, for instance, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Ursula K. Le Guin in books like The Left Hand of Darkness, or Orson Scott Card, notably in Speaker for the Dead, where in both of those books, a major theme is coming to understand the other outside of a context of competition and survival but of mutualism and understanding. Um, how do you think that these alternative trends interact with, um, interact with this binary that you've been proposing between Lewis and kind of medieval Christian metaphysics and cosmology mm -hmm. and kind of the very STEM-oriented um, <laughs> science fiction? Yeah. Great question. I knew someone was going to ask this question because it's the obvious question. As soon as I start talking, you start thinking of every single science fiction thing that does something different. And of course, they're out there. That's yeah. true. I, I don't think that conflicts with the picture that I'm painting. I think it actually, I think it actually um, reinforces the picture I'm painting for two reasons. Well, I'll just make a quick note. Ursula Guin and Orson Scott Card, as far as I know, they are religious people, right? And so they're bringing in their, their I mean, Ursula Scott Card is Mormon. Mm -hmm. um, Le Guin is. She's, She's Episcopalian. <laughs> well, it depends on which part of the. It depends on which part of the. Uh, she was the, traditional Episcopalian. Yeah. So. But that was before the break. She was. She was part of the Episcopal Church that was before this break in this progressive movement. That's Langle. Like, like, yeah, that's not what Langle, not Ursula Kaylee. Ursula Kaylee Gwynn is the daughter of an anthropologist. Yes, I know. I know. So let's not get too sidetracked by this. But, but yes. So so all right, maybe Le Guin's in dispute. But Card has religious themes in his work. He's Mormon. They're there. That's cool. So there are a lot of science fiction authors who are religious, who are interested in religion, who bring those themes to bear. Um, but this gets to the bigger issue with what you're saying. is Not issue with what you're saying, but, but how I would synthesize what you're saying into my sort of binary world here is that something we didn't get to talk about is that science fiction, nevertheless, at the very best, is still guided by uh, Socrates' definition of you know, how we start with truth, with wonder, right? That's the best science fiction. And so when I see science fiction operating, it's, it's sort of, I would nuance my picture to say, it's belabored under the weight of secularism's history. But it's still the best of it, some of it's very dark and cynical, but the best of it, that you, the examples you can think of, are are still oriented toward the truth. They want to know, but they don't know how because all the tools they have are secular. And so the really brilliant science fiction that I, I like, these exceptions, you know, I like of course Scott Carl and stuff, they are, they are trying to make that jump into the beyond. They are trying to do the step that I, I, I'm talking about. And, and that's because any modernity and medieval, it's not that they're opposites, they're in dialectical relationship to each other. You can't be a reaction to the medievals without having some part of them in you. You know, modernity was taught its tools of logic and reason and science by the medievals. And so we've taken those tools and now are questioning what's going on there. And so this is a dialectic that's still playing out. And I guess the difference between Lewis and, and all these other guys uh, in this nuanced picture that I'm now giving is that he's simply more educated than on, on medieval, you know, he's a, he had a triple first from, from Cambridge, I believe, or Oxford. And that's equivalent to three master's degrees. He read all of the classics in their original languages. He was reading and speaking fluent. So he simply has more tools to draw on and better perspectives to write this kind of amazing thing that, you know, whatever other writers are great, I like them, but they simply don't have the resources to plunge into that real final frontier that he has. I think that explains the difference. In the back, and then. Um, your background is not STEM, correct? <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> only because that's the problem. You see, 
Um, especially now, the STEM people are all believing in science as a religion. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I have a background in biology. Um, you brought up boiling water. Is it that? No, it ain't. I can change boiling water. I can add salt and make you have to put more energy into it and more temperature. So it's not boiled at 200 and whatever degrees. Um, but the average person sees that fat. 200, 100 degrees of boiling, 100 degrees Celsius. But it's not in stone. And that's where it's actually become another religion. Mm -hmm. And their religion of science they believe is it as immutable as the medieval believe mm. in certain aspects of religion. That's where the new authors have to work. Right. To, uh, because people like Madeline Langle, I studied under Madeline Langle. Oh, great. Uh, Madeline said people are not people are putting a wall between science and religion. Most good scientists can say, I don't know. Right. We're not there yet. There's something there that we can't explain. But when they teach it in schools, they teach it as fact. They teach it as dogma, right? Dogma. Yeah. So yes, dogma. that's the word I'm looking for. You guys are you guys are help, are like calling out what I wanted to nuance in the talk but didn't get more time to do. Actually, I lied. I was in, I was doing entomology before I switched to all this humanities nonsense. Um, okay. I just remembered that as you were talking. I, I, there, there's a good language yeah. of using this that lets me believe that it's a step back. Right? Yeah, so I did entomology for how bugs are cool. Um, so, here's, here's what I learned doing that, which is that what I'm lambasting in my talk here is popular scientism as dogma, yeah. which is completely yes. different than real science, as you rightly point out. I'm always bonking my undergraduates on the heads when I lecture and telling them, look, the law of gravity, what does that mean? Did you get it from Moses? No, <laughs> it's not real. All it means is that every single time we've observed, we've observed this happening, this happens. That's it. I have to emphasize to people that real science and true scientists know that they're saying as little as they possibly can because they want to be consistent with the facts and open to new ideas. And science, science works, the progress of science historically is not by just like next fact, next fact, next fact. They propose models, the models work for a while, we realize something is wrong with the model, and then we make a new model, but for a while the old model still works. So when heliocentrism came onto the scene, it wasn't fully developed, and the models for geocentrism were more accurate in predicting the movement of the bodies than heliocentrism was when it first arrived on the scene. So science progresses by these sort of conceptual models that real scientists know, like, it's just a model. We don't actually know how it works. We're ready to revise it. So they're very open to truth in a deep level, but it's, it's rarer and rarer, in, at least in my in my encounters to, to find people who are committed to that kind of a, an old school, honest science, they're just wrapped up in the religion of scientism, which is utterly unscientific. Then you have corporation into it. Oh, don't, don't, don't get me started on all that. Yes, sir. My impression is that we're no longer living in the 50s and 60s, and a lot of popular science fiction today is less influenced by modernism especially by, by a myth of progress, and much more what I would characterize as sort of a, a revival of paganism or, or of pagan thinking in two ways. We see a lot of emphasis on cycles. There's no assumption of progress, a lot of dystopian sci-fi, the recognition that civilizations rise and fall, humanity might become extinct, all these fears because they see cycles in history and in, and in prehistory. And then also we see a recognition that religion isn't going away, that there are religion is part of human experience. But it's more sort of a pagan awareness that yes, different civilizations have different religions, they have their gods. Everyone talks about the different gods that people have. And examples of that that I think contrast very much with Star Trek and the sort of myth of progress in Star Trek are the, the reimagined Battlestar Galactica and then also The Expanse, where religion is very much part of both of those worlds. Right but there's still these perils to humanity. It's not the assumption that everything's always gonna get better. And I wonder how, how a medieval, someone taking a medieval view, like a worldview like C.S. Lewis's, 
would engage with that sort of worldview that we see increasingly reflected in sci-fi now that's less infatuated with modernism but is reviving a lot of pagan thinking that says everybody has their religion and history's full of cycles and humanity it might not necessarily have a future because these cycles might just lead to our, our downfall. Mm -hmm. how, how would someone taking a more Christian sort of medieval worldview engage with that and critique that just as C.S. Lewis did with, with uh, the modernist views that he was encountering? So it, it's very true that I mean, at this point C.S. Lewis is sort of outdated in that who the enemy is shifted, right? And this has to do with with the postmodern disenchantment with modernity. I mean, that's why we have postmodernity and relativism, because you know, the, the apex of all this myth of progress stuff and science and technology was dropping a bomb on Hiroshima. I mean, that's really the climax in a very real way of the seeds of the Enlightenment. I, I can argue about that later with you if you want. But like it's it's massive disillusionment happens. Side note, this is why in anime, like they're always post-apocalyptic stuff, because this imagery is in Japanese culture from the last century. So that is the question that remains to be asked. And I I think a further answer to that question would be long uh, and worth devoting some time to. But I will suggest two points to that. One is that I hesitate to call post-modernity pagan. Because when we lay out sort of the eras of history and the major philosophic driving themes of them, pagan and medieval are very, very synchronous. They're tight. They're almost the same thing from a fundamental perspective. Truth is fundamental in reality. There's an order to the cosmos. Man is not the center. Like these kinds of things, it's very easy in a certain sense for people like Paul to evangelize to Greeks because they share the same fundamental assumptions about reality. Modernity is the is the weird like a younger child in this in this picture, and so post-modernity reacting to modernity, it has its own character, and that character is one I would call post-Christian, and what I mean by that is not just that it's not Christian, but that it it's post-Christian. It exists in the wake of Christian themes and Christian imagery. We can't escape it. In the relativism and the atheism and the secularism of our culture, there are Christian themes everywhere because Western man does not know how to think any more outside of a Christian framework, no matter how strident he is in his atheism or, or pick whatever worldview you want. So the relativism that you mentioned, it's not the same kind of pagan relativism. It's really a step back from making these really strong claims that the Enlightenment they just want to relax truth claims and then kind of see what happens. With the pagans, it was like, you do your thing, you do your thing. Like, they would have two different gods. One culture would encounter another culture. They see each other as gods, and they identify. They go, ah, that god is our god. Uh, Jupiter is Zeus. Got it. We're on the same page, which is a different culture to speak different languages. And so in a sense, they're more truly pluralistic than we are now. We're trying to relax truth claims because we don't, we tried and we failed and now we don't want another World War II. So we're, we're being real careful about what we say to each other now. In, in antiquity, it's like everybody knows there's the gods, there's spirits under them, there's sort of like one god who runs everything kind of, you know, depends on exactly the nuance. There's always a fertility god, there's always a god of death. And so they identify with each other more as a coherent set. Paganism is, is the details are not as important to them. Right? It's like, oh, you do you, I'll do me. No, no, it's like we're doing the same thing. So there's a synchrony in paganism hmm. that is not present in modernity. Modernity has no, or post-modernity, has no center. We're, we're waiting to see what center emerges, but, but we're not quite there yet. And where we go from there, we'll see. Hmm. Good question, thank you. Yes, sir. I guess, could you say a little more about C.S. Lewis and scientism? Because one of the things, especially in the space trilogy, that uh, rubbed me the wrong way, maybe just as a child of the secular age, is how not only he seems to oppose scientism, which is a major theme in the rest of his work, but in the space trilogy, he seems to replace uh, the facts of the universe with uh, supernatural runnings of things. And we see the sort of in, I mean, pretty clearly just adopting the you know, spirits uh, steering the heavens. Mm -hmm that like use it as, oh, the thing that you're not getting in science, the thing that science hasn't 
explain is supernatural. Mm -hmm. uh, and can you talk more about that? Is that in Lewis? Am I just re reading that into it? Because that seems to be uh, infringing upon some sort of autonomy of the natural. Right, so I think that's a great question, and this is a criticism you get from atheism, which is like, oh, the god of the gaps, if you've heard of this. Yeah. Oh, God's only there because you can't explain it with science. Like, we got an explanation, done. Um, I don't think that's what Lewis is doing. I deeply think he's aware of that, and he's working against it. So another, only, the only, the only moderns believe that there is a distinction between the supernatural and the natural. That distinction is purely modern. The medievals don't mm -hmm. have it, the pagans don't have it. Um, you see it in the Lord's Prayer, uh, no, in the Creed, where uh, of all things visible and invisible. That's the distinction of all creation under the one God, visible and invisible, not natural and supernatural. These would be alien terms to ancient people. They would not understand what you're talking about at all, because to them, there's a, there's a harmony to the cosmos. The, net, the, the visible and the invisible work together. So. It's not that there are these two tiers to reality, it's just the parts you can't see. And to me, that's very synchronous with modern science. You know, there's all kinds of stuff that we can't see, forces and powers that move the world around. You know, but, but science can't answer questions that we could speculate on in cool science fiction, which is, well, are these powers lifeless laws or are they intelligences? Good question, I don't know. But it doesn't conflict with an understanding of, of natural science, right? We, all we're observing with natural science is what happens. Gravity, etc. We only look at phenomena. The deep hidden causes and the central motions in the universe are not things that science is able, just by its methodology, to really approach very well. So I'm speculating, you know, I don't, this needs to be fleshed out, but like, what if the law of gravity was an intelligence? You know, what if, what if what we call forces of nature are spirits ministering? They're just unseen forces that have minds. They move and they're op operational for all this stuff. And they do it diligently. There is different kind of intelligence than we would think about. I don't know if that's the best example, but that maybe gives you a sense of what the distinction that a medieval would make and not one that a modern would make. Um, thank you. I think the presentation was brilliant and really helps me understand the first two novels in the trilogy. Yes. And then you got the third one. <laughs> That's the one. Which has different kinds of themes of yes. totalitarianism, persecution of religion, uh, Merlin. political correctness, you know, the government, hero called the Wizards, Bears. And then there's <laughs> Merlin, yeah. yeah. Please. <laughs> Explain to me. Explain to me. <laughs> <laughs> Explain, Merlin. Explain, Merlin. I mean, what, 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 what function does he, what is, what is Lewis trying to get at by bringing in Merlin from the dead? Oh, I know. Oh, that is a great question. So, sorry for the spoiler. Um, Merlin is an, he, so I can answer, as a literary creature, what is Lewis doing with Merlin? I can answer that question. There's a lot going on with his Arthurian sub-theme in that book. It's incredibly rich and complex. What he's doing that I think is relevant to this talk with Merlin is that he's bringing basically a fifth century man into the 20th century and then showing him the world and saying, all right, well, now what do you make of this? And Merlin is completely baffled by modernity. He has no idea why people live the way that they do. Um, and he tries to articulate and understand and ask questions of the other characters well, wait, what do you mean, how does this work? Well, why do people do this? Well, what's going on with Christendom? One of the questions she asks is, All right, well, let's go to the emperor. And Ransom is like, there's no emperor. And this is like earth shattering to, to Merlin. Merlin's like, no emperor? Like, has the world fallen apart? And, and, and Ransom's like, yes. So um, <laughs> Merlin is such an important contrasting figure to the dystopian, the dystopian themes that are going on here. And I see Daniel. I'm going to read a little passage on Merlin, very brief, two seconds. Um, let me grab it here. I should have bookmarked this. I know somebody was going to, to, to say this. It's right here. And Merlin, or this is a great way to end, too. Ransom, after Merlin's trying to like understand what are our options fighting the enemy, what do we do, and he doesn't understand the modern world at all, Ransom gives this summary to Merlin of what's going on how there's really no hope for all these other things, and how they have to take the path that's ahead of them, that God set for them. This is Ransom's summary 
of modernity mm. in the 20th century. Ransom shook his head. You do not understand, he said. The poison was brewed in these west lands, but has spat itself everywhere by now. However far you went, you would find the machines, the crowded cities, the empty thrones, the false writings, the barren beds. Men maddened with false promises and soured with true miseries, worshiping the iron works of their own hands, cut off from earth their mother and from the father in heaven. You might go east, so far that east became west, and you returned to Britain across the great ocean, but even so, you would not have come out anywhere into the light. The shadow of one dark wing is over all of Telus. Mm. 